Hello and welcome to Through the Telescope, the podcast that puts the lens on astronomy. I'm Rose Waugh and I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator. And I'm Elliot Bruce and I'm neither of those things, but I'll be trying to find out why we should even care about astronomy. We'll be exploring some of the big topics in the field in little manageable pieces and have some fun along the way. So, whether you know your red lines from your red shifts, or you're not quite sure what the difference between astronomy and astrology actually is, join us as we launch ourselves into the cosmos and try not to burn up on re-entry. Through the Telescope is sponsored by Pic Astro, the astronomy and astrophotography image sharing app, dedicated to your images of the cosmos no matter what stage you are on your journey around the universe. No ads, spam, or fake accounts. So, Ro. Today, we're talking about the solar system. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I'll know some of this one. <laughs> um, I hope so. Yeah. The Earth, that's important. Uh-huh. Um, do you want to take us through what exactly we mean by the solar system? What is the solar system? What's in it? A quick journey through, if you will. If you will. Okay. Uh, well... In the centre of the solar system is the sun, uh, which is a star. I assume our listeners are, are well aware of that fact. We won't say too much about the sun, because I think it could have entire episodes in its own right. Mm. But it exists. It's a, it's a star and it's a pretty, pretty small star, really in terms of how big they can get. Um, but, you know, it's not tiny. Mm. And it's kind of midlife. It's it's a pretty average star. Right. Does it have a midlife crisis? Do stars have midlife crises? Uh, I don't know. I guess that's maybe like the red giant phase. So. Oh. So we're not there yet, are we? No. Okay. Yeah, so it's pretty average, which is not a bad thing. And as probably most most people listening to this anyway, are aware most of the mass in the solar system is in the sun. So um, the solar system is 1.0014 solar masses. Hang on, can you say that again? 1 point... 1.0014 solar masses. Right, so immediately I'm thinking that a solar mass is, is mass. defined as the mass of the sun. Yeah. And oh, and the solar system is. Yeah. I thought you were going to tell me that the sun is one point zero zero one solar masses. I was like, you know, I, think I would. Wrong then. I would not put that past astronomy, uh, but no, that's not what I'm telling you. Okay, that makes a lot. Okay, so yes, uh, what even is that? One point zero zero one? Do you say? So, yeah. So basically, the rest of the solar system is is nothing. Point one percent. Tiny. And presumably quite a lot of that is, like, Jupiter. <laughs> like, we're not even getting close to no, mattering. No, no. I mean, we matter, yes. but not in that sense. Yeah. We matter, but we don't matter, if yeah. you like. Yeah. So then, you know, then you reach your first first planet of the solar system, that's Mercury. Um, yeah, it's... How, uh, how far do I need to travel to get from the sun to Mercury? So... Well, if we use astronomical units, so that's the distance between the sun and the earth. Okay. That's a pretty standard way of measuring distances, at least within the solar system. Does that ever get confusing? Because, um, you know, like a parsec, mm. famous from the Kessel Run in Star Wars, is also presumably an astronomical unit, in that it is a unit used in astronomy. Yes. Does that ever get confusing? <laughs> what, a parsec? No, just like an astronomical unit. Which astronomical? No, the astronomical unit. Oh, right. Unit. N- no. <laughs> not, <laughs> not really. Um, <laughs> although most people would call it an AU. Okay. Rather than giving it its full full title. Mm. 
Anyway, yeah, so, so let's go by those units. You're traveling about 0.4 of an AU to get from the sun to Mercury. And an AU is the sun to the Earth. Yeah. The center of the sun. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's like almost halfway between us and the sun. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And it's pretty small. It's pretty mm. hot. Doesn't have any moons. In fact, it's too close to the sun to be able to have a moon. Um, if it did have a moon, it would just you know, lose it to the sun. So Can't have nice things. Pretty tragic. Mm. Um, yeah, and then travel a bit further. If you travel 0.7 of an AU from the sun... You get to Venus. Okay, we're almost home at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Venus is pretty hot. It's got a pretty thick atmosphere. It's the hottest planet so that, in the solar system. That's weird because mm. uh, naively, uh, I remember I had a, a lecturer at uni who would say, you might naively expect, and I always hated it when I said it. Anyway, <laughs> um, you might naively expect um, that Mercury would be the hottest. So, like, what? Yeah. So, because Mercury is 0. 0.4 AU from the Sun. Yes. And Venus is 0. 0.7. Yes. So why is Mercury not the hottest? Because it doesn't have an atmosphere. And Venus has... A, a runaway greenhouse gas effect. Right. So, um, yes. So you'd like to go to Venus because you like the no. heat. As a as a young person, even just the words "runaway greenhouse gas effect" is starting to give me like the the eco anxiety. Yeah. So let's progress. Okay. <laughs> to a planet which doesn't have any. Issues with greenhouse gases. Uh, Earth. The Earth. Yeah. Um, at one AU. You're right. Funny that. Is that a definition? The Earth just happens to be exactly one Earth distance from the sun. It's a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle. Pretty exciting planet. My favourite planet. It's got a lot going on. With, with the, old, the old AUs there, presumably, because... I know a thing or two, right? And the Earth's orbit is not a circle, right? It's Indeed. It's like more of a, an ellipse or an oval. So if it's like a, squ a squished circle, does that mean, is an AU like the average? Because like right now, are we more or less of an AU? Do you know what I mean? Um, yes. So, uh, if you think of an ellipse, mm. I don't, I mean, I don't know how many of our listeners are, are into maths, but, um, the, the, yeah, there are two ways you could measure, um, like a, like a radius, if you like. If you have okay. a circle, mm. the distance from the centre to any point is the same. Yep. That's what makes it a circle. Yep. If you have an ellipse, then you're going to have two two points that are like the closest and two points that are the furthest away. Yeah. You've sort of got a short radius and a long radius. Yeah. A minimum, a minimum and a maximum radius. Yeah, so I think like you could take averages, right, to get it, it's roughly one AU or roughly whatever. Mm. For a lot of the planets in the solar system actually treating the orbits as a circle is not half bad. Oh. That that's pretty good. Um I feel like in a lot of science it's like So like the that's simplification's how, bad. Like work. you know, Kepler came up with it quite a long time ago. I couldn't give you a year for which this work was first published. Mm. But um but like it's time. it's not half bad. But for some of them, it doesn't work quite so well. Mm. Kudos to yeah. Mr. Kepler. Yeah, so the next stop is Mars. Okay. The yep. red planet. Yeah. Got some ice caps. Pretty nice. good. And it's got a lot of sand. Do the ice caps actually have frozen water? Yeah. Oh. Okay. 
and um, and also the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of is on Mars. Is it active? No, it's a dead volcano. <laughs> is that worse than an extinct volcano? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, is it? <clears throat> I've got my brain in toddler gear because I was trying to explain extinct volcanoes to them the other day and I realised they didn't know <laughs> age three what the word extinct means they, they, also like don't dinosaurs. Know what, they also don't know what the word dead means so I'm not sure that really helped but anyway um, it's, it, the volcano doesn't go pew pew anymore okay <laughs> yeah so it's got, it's got a pretty big one Mount Olympus might have heard of it. No, that's in Greece, bro. <laughs> we can cut that. <laughs> uh, Mars is going to take you one and a half AU from the sun together. Okay. Uh, that's pretty close to us. Yeah, not, not oh. too far, really. All in all. Mm. If you want to get out to the asteroid belt, then okay. you're going to have to travel 2.8 AU from the sun. And what is the asteroid belt? Um, It's a lot of asteroids between (laughs) Mars and Jupiter. Arranged in a belt kind of shape. Yeah. Um, And it happens to contain a few interesting things, like Ceres, which is a dwarf planet. We'll come back to that later, though. Okay. So So that's Mm 2.8 AU from the Sun. Okay. If you want to get to Jupiter, which is the next most exciting thing, Next stop. Next stop. You're going to have to travel 5.2 AU from the sun. I guess that's now quite a big jump. Yeah, so we're starting to get into the the biggest distances there. 2.8 to to 5.2 between the asteroid belt and Jupiter. If you're keen to visit Saturn, obviously pretty exciting. One of the best planets. Good rings. 9.5 AU from the sun. So that's almost twice as far as Jupiter. Mm-hmm. See, I, I think I always imagine it's like the first four, then you got Jupiter, and Saturn comes right right after. Right, yeah, I guess they're often shown like that in pictures. But when you think about how massive the planets are, yeah. they've got to give each other a bit of space. It's also when they have a picture of the sun, and it's not like... Yeah, you can still see scale. the planets. Yeah. And you're like, Jupiter looks the same size as the sun. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to Uranus, because we're British, Mm. and I'm not going to Americanify that word, and we like to snigger at these jokes. Does the BBC say Uranus? Yes. I don't don't know what's the issue. It's not that hard to say Uranus. But anyway, um, yeah, if you want to go there, 19.2 19.2 AU. So that's like twice as... So Saturn is basically, not quite, but basically twice as far from the Sun as Jupiter. And then Uranus is twice as far again. Mm-hmm. Jeez. Neptune, mm. next planet along, 30.1 AU. Right, so that, yeah, that's then like the same kind of distance as Saturn mm-hmm. to Uranus. Yeah. And that, so Uranus is 30 times as far from the sun as we are. Yes. Jeez. If you want to visit Pluto, okay. our favourite dwarf planet, or at least the general public's favourite, it's not my favourite. <laughs> Sorry, Pluto fans. Uh, 39.5 AU, roughly. But that's its semi-major axis, so... If you wanted to know the range, because we know that Pluto has a pretty weird accent. Right. Uh, ac- God, I'm so tired. <laughs> we know that Pluto has a pretty weird orbit around the sun. Okay. It's not very neat. It's pretty mm. elliptical and crazy. The range um, of distances that you'd have to travel, depending on when it was closest and furthest away mm. from the sun, is 29.7 AU at its closest. Or forty nine point three AU at its furthest away. Mm. Oh, so this is also this is also to do with because the semi major axis is 
going to be the the largest radii on on the ellipse, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got a semi-minor is the short. Mm -hmm. It's half the distance between the two sort of closest points opposite on the ellipse. And a semi-major axis is half the distance between the two furthest away. But then that ellipse is shifted, so the sun isn't at the middle of the ellipse. The sun is towards one end, as it were. Yes. So, yes. right, okay. So it's like 40 AU, pretty much, from the centre of its ellipse to the edge, the, the longest edge. But that's not the distance to the sun. Yes. Which is between 30 and 50. That was very well explained, because I cannot explain these things without a picture, which obviously by podcast is a bit challenging. Yeah, well, I think it, it, yeah, it is always difficult talking about geometry mm -hmm. on, on a podcast, but there you go. Okay. If you want to get to the Kuiper belt, yeah, basically the same, 39.5, so basically the same as to Pluto. So what is the Kuiper belt? Um, it's kind of similar to the asteroid belt in a way. It's full of Kuipers. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's filled with bits of rock okay. left over from the formation of the solar system okay. that weren't able to really form into anything particularly big. Right. You know, they never made it into planets. And it, they're not made of quite the same stuff as the asteroid belt, it turns out. Okay. So is it like there was different stuff in the sort of close to the sun and different stuff further out? Is that why it's different? Or I don't know. I'm actually looking into that mm. for another time. Yeah. Well. Uh, and after the Kuiper belt, you have potentially the Oort cloud, which I'm sure you're going to ask me a lot about later. So there are, you know, other things as well in the solar system. So there are comets, obviously. Um... There are other dwarf planets, so Pluto is not a planet, it's a dwarf planet. Ceres, we also mentioned as a dwarf planet, lives in the asteroid belt. But there's also Eris, Haumea, and Makemake. Maki. So that's five dwarf planets. Five dwarf planets. And eight planets. Okay. Here's a way that maybe the listeners could help us, or help me anyway. I don't know about you, but I, growing up, learned the order of my planets mm. using the what's it called when you put you make a sentence out of the first letters oh is that it's a mnemonic a is it a mnemonic i don't know well anyway out of that thing for my very easy method just speeds up naming planets and i still have to do it and i want to get them in the right order see i think you're fine because you just do my very easy method what was it? <laughs> Just speeds up. Naming. Naming. There and you then, go. And then I have to go, planets. Uh, because be fine. it just doesn't, you know. So maybe maybe people get taught or have come up with some better ones since then that are up to date. If mm. so, please please at us and and suggest some good ways of remembering. Um, yeah, so eight planets, five dwarf planets. And I guess we should probably clarify the difference between the two. Uh, please, do. is it just, it's a small planet? Kind of, really. It kind of is that. So to be a planet, you have to orbit a star. Check. You have to be big enough to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, which basically means you're big enough to be spherical. You okay. can't be like lumpy right. or not spherical. Can't be like a potato shape, mm -hmm. unless it's a very spherical potato. And you have to have cleared out a path as you as you orbit around the, right, around the okay. star. So you can't have like, you know, lots of... Stuff in in your path. You can't have an asteroid belt. 
and you can't ex- well yeah <laughs> and you can't have you know you can't be interacting too much with other planets for example so that's pluto's kind of issue right, okay. it it follows a weird path around the sun and sometimes it crosses in front of um in front of Neptune, as in closer to the sun. Oh, jeez. And sometimes it doesn't, um, which is obviously a bit funky. That is. But they're not, it's not cleared out its path, right? Because it's... Yes. So, so yeah, they're the three things that you have to, to, to be, to be a planet. But does that mean that Uranus hasn't cleared out its path? Because... I don't think Pluto really... <laughs> it doesn't add up to much. Influences right, okay. it much, I think, is the... Is the gist of it. Yeah. Um, so this is a requirement by the IAU, the mm. International Astronomical Union. And mm. I think later on in this, not this particular episode, but later episodes, we might chat about a funny story about that. But we'll leave it there for now. So, yeah, and there are lots of, lots of moons in our solar system. We've got Mercury one. Mercury doesn't have any. Neither does Venus. You're right, we have one, so that's one. So we've got the first moon. We've got the first moon. Oh, nice. We've also got a really impressive moon because it's very big relative to us. Is that because we're really small or is that because the moon's really big? Or a bit of both? Uh, that's a good question, but I think it's because the moon is really big. Nice. Uh, Mars has two. Jupiter has 91. Slightly more than two. Yes. Well, 91 that we know of right now, because we do keep finding more all the time. Okay. Saturn has 83. Jeez. Um, Jupiter and Saturn seem to be like, have have a moon off quite regularly. <laughs> you know, I check and it'd be like, oh, Saturn's got the most moons. And then the next year, Jupiter's got the most, <laughs> the most moons. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. We're discovering more literally all the time. Um, Uranus has 27, which seems like a lot less, but um, it's also kind of hard, I think, to tell. It's hard to spot moons Mm. as we're getting further and further away from the sun. So whilst it makes sense, perhaps, that Jupiter and Saturn might have more, the kind of comparison between the different planets is maybe not so... Fair, if you see what I mean. and Saturn is twice as far as Jupiter, and Uranus is twice as far again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, Neptune has 14. Okay. So, you know, again, it's hard to know how much of that is related to... Getting further and further ...biasing from our inability to see them, and how much of that is just, you know, reality. And we know about five around Pluto. So that's quite a lot, really. Hmm. Does that does that count? As, as, can can a dwarf planet have moons? Yeah. Or is it a dwarf moon? No, I don't think the moon is a dwarf. I'm trying really hard to say dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and also you know we've mentioned how beautiful Saturn's rings are, but actually it's not the only planet in the solar system to have rings, it's just that they happen to be the most spectacular. Um, but actually all four of the gas giants have rings. I've not seen rings around Jupiter. Really? I've, I've never seen that depicted. Like, what Are they, how, you say Saturn is, small is has bit, the best. Yeah. Is, is it like, is it that Jupiter has really small rings or is it that it technically has rings but only if you kind of look at a graph or something. Do you know what I mean? No, they're just really small. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Jupiter doesn't need rings. It's no, it's got, got a lot going on. It doesn't need anything else. It's got a storm, red eye, whatever it's called. Red spot. Great red spot. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So we've got rings, we've got asteroid belts, we've got Kuiper belts, which I hope is filled with Kuiperoids. <laughs> But it also sounds like some kind of disease. But um, yeah, lots said, of stuff going on. He said at the edge we've got the Oort cloud. Mm-hmm. Oort cloud, Oort cloud. 
Probably Lots not. Lots of pronunciations. I always say oat cloud. But... So, what is the oat cloud? Well, it's a theoretical or predicted collection of icy, rocky pieces that surround the solar system. Okay. This is separate to the Kuiper Belt. Mm -hmm. Kuiper Belt. Yeah, so rather than being like a disc okay. like that, it's like spherical. So it goes all around the solar system. Right, so we're kind of like, it's like we're so the like, inside of an egg. Yeah. And it's the shell. Yeah. Or the white, maybe. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Uh, if it exists, it could contain billions of objects. Why doesn't the stuff just collapse down on top of the sun? What do you mean? Well, you know, like, we don't have planets above the sun. Mm. They're all sort of vaguely, you know, in a plane, right? Mm-hmm. So... Why is the oak cloud thinking it's so special? <laughs> well, I suspect because if Pluto is 30 to 50 AU from the sun, mm. then the oak cloud would be 2,000 to 5,000 AU to its inner edge. 2,000 to 5,000? Yeah. Right, okay. To the inner edge. Okay. If you want to go to the outer edge, mm -hmm. that could be 10,000 to 100,000 AU. And so that's a that's a factor of ten there, mm -hmm. ten to a hundred thousand. Is that because it's theoretical? So we just don't know what somebody's. Yeah, it's hard to, work to know maths. how much how much we really know about it. You know, right? It, not a lot of stuff can be deduced from you know theoretical or predicted work without observations mm. or without much you know to go by but observations without theory are a bit shaky and theory without observations is a bit shaky we you know it makes everyone more comfortable <laughs> mm. to to have a good influence of both into things so why do we even think this exists well lots of lots of space scientists think this is where the um like the very long Orbit comets come from. So, like comets that we see every like thousand years or something. Is that what long? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like the the time scale, maybe okay. a thousand isn't very long. I don't know, but and comets are icy, right? Yeah, icy rocky. Things. And if, you know, potentially would made of not quite the same kind of composition mm. as other things. Because that seems to be true within our solar system, right? Mm. So, yeah. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Where did the rock come from? The, uh, Presumably during the formation of the star, but yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, the the distances there to the outer edge that I said, the 10,000 mm. to 100,000 AU. That's like the equivalent of a quarter to a half of the distance to our nearest star. Right, like to the next star over, so... Yeah, so to Proxima Centauri. Right, so it, it could be halfway between. Do they then have their own? Great question. Could, could we have sort of mm -hmm. one shared oat boundary? Jeez. Those are big distances. Though. Yeah, it's insane, isn't it? Jeez. It, like, blows your mind. And that's also how people end up changing units for things, right? Because right. it, it's so much easier to kind of comprehend mm. the idea of, like, oh, half the distance yeah. to, to the nearest star than it is to be like, oh, 100,000 AU. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, just you just get to silly numbers, really, pretty quickly. So have we got any hope of, like, actually detecting any of it? Like, we were saying that it's difficult to spot moons of planets that are much closer. Like, is there any way that we can prove that the Oak Cloud exists? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, it's so far away from us. Mm. If it if it exists, it's so far away from us. Um, so, like, right now there's, like, Voyager 1 and 2, the New Horizons, Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecrafts. Um, they're, like, leaving, you know, we've sent them off into space. Mm on their merry way. But the distances that they would have to travel to get to the Oak Cloud, their their power sources would be, you know, long dead. Centuries even before they got to the inner edge of it. Did people think about that? Yeah, I suspect they did. (laughs) Um, Do they not want to, like, load a sort so, of nuclear weapons worth of uranium <laughs> or something onto it? Probably not. Um, so Voyager 1 um, travels about a million miles every day. Okay. So that's it a lot of steps on its like, That's a lot of steps, bit. yeah. The, the spacecraft would take about 300 years to reach the inner boundary of the arc cloud. Right. And then probably another 30,000 years to exit the far side. All right. So, yeah, that's a lot of uranium. <laughs> it says 300 years ago, the Acts of Union are signed between Scotland and England. Um, we really wanting to the bring United, that one up. <laughs> the United States of America has not yet been founded. And lots of other history is also happening. Um, that I don't know about. Mm. Jeez. Yeah. So, you know, how we would detect it is a very good question, but it's not going to be, as with many things in, in astronomy, it's not going to be by sending something there. Right, yeah. Um. But plenty of discoveries have been made of many things in the universe without actually physically sending something there. Mm. So, you know, all hope is not lost. Um, But yeah, someone is going to have to think up a creative way of being able to potentially detect Mm. its existence or not. I guess most things that you, the way you detect most things is with light of some sort. But... Mm -hmm. Presumably, this is like so far away, and there's no other light sources out there. If you know what I mean, mm-hmm. it's not reflecting from a star, and it's so cold, so it's unlikely to be any use in a mission of any sort, really. Mm. Yeah. Is this named after Professor Oort? Is that what yeah, it is named after someone. Yeah, someone Oort. I'm very sorry, because that's definitely not how you pronounce his name. But I was going to say Johannes, but I don't think that's true. Oh. Well, I'm sure that Professor Oort is used to it, and is probably all right with having a cloud named after him. If you know what I mean. Yeah. But, yeah. Pretty cool claim to fame. It is. Yeah. And so is that then the end of the hypothetical... Oort cloud is, like, end of the line. End of the solar system? Yeah. If we're rubbing up against Proxima Centauri, yeah. potentially. It's pretty difficult to define where the edge of the solar system is. Because it could be between 10 and 100,000 AU. Well, also that, yes, but never, you know... There are kind of various ways in which you might define the end of it. Because you, there's, you know, it's not like the Earth, obviously, well, I was going to say the Earth obviously has an edge, but even the Earth doesn't necessarily have an edge, right? Because you could say, you could say it's the surface, or you could say, oh, well, actually it's when, you know, you've reached the edge of the atmosphere. Yeah. And as soon as you say that, it's like, well, where well, does the atmosphere the actually atmosphere? end? Is it the stratosphere right. or exactly. the other th- spheres that have names? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so it's kind of difficult to put an actual edge on it. 
Yeah. There's like a thing, right, um, about where does space begin, which is the, yes, the same question. Yeah, it's the same the question, but backwards, yeah. Um, so you could you could perfectly reasonably use the art cloud as a description as the the edge of the solar system. Hmm. Or you might perhaps pick something else. So you might say the heliosphere is is where the magnetic sun, field of our sun meets the magnetic field of the Milky Way. And beyond this is beyond the influence of our star. Therefore, oh, okay. it is outside the solar system. So we've just had a fun-packed tour of the solar system, all the way from the sun to the outer edges of the Oort cloud. And I thought that maybe this would be a good time to talk about another visitor from the Oort cloud, um, the comet that's going past at the moment that people are talking about uh, at the time of recording at the beginning of February. Yeah, the Green Comet. The Green Comet, which sounds like something that's going to herald the apocalypse <laughs> or maybe the birth of, I don't know, some form of messiah. Maybe it is. Who um, knows? Who knows? Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, do you know why it's green, Ro? Have you seen? It's green because it contains dicarbon. That's right, it's green because it's chemistry. Um, and... The gas evaporates as it gets close, relatively speaking, to the sun. Uh, but you're the chemist, so maybe you can tell me what dicarbon actually is. Well, I had to look it up because... So it's diatomic carbon, or dicarbon for short. Right, um, well that makes more sense already. Yeah, so it's two carbon atoms stuck together, um, which... Uh, is odd and um, that's not what we see on earth under normal conditions um, you might have heard of diamond or graphite or even graphene these are okay uh, on the earth yeah, graphite is the one that you put in my wedding ring right uh, that's the one <laughs> um, and yeah, but it's actually, it reminded me a bit of our conversation in one of the Exoplanets episodes, talking about how um, chemistry can benefit astronomy, as it were, or astronomy is the study of space you know, with a range of sciences, as it were. Um, but also, you know, we, I mean, I'm sure that people have observed dicarbon on Earth, but um, it's, it's an exotic form of carbon that is unstable, or metastable, I guess, right. on Earth. Mm -hmm. So at like one bar or one atmosphere and room temperature. Um, so it is two carbon atoms which are double bonded together. Um, if anyone with any knowledge of chemistry is listening... Uh, and then they've got a couple of lone pairs of electrons sticking out either end. Uh, so it's a bit like um, ethene, which right. is the um, bit that you use to make polyethylene, but without the hydrogens attached. But anywho, it's a strange form of carbon that we don't get on Earth. So I have a couple of questions. Please. One you can definitely answer. Okay. The other you might not know the answer to off the top of your head. I don't know. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like you to clarify mm. for for my own enjoyment yeah. and also for our listeners' benefit, perhaps, what you mean by room temperature. Okay. So... Room temperature is uh, a technical term, which it seems to me, as a <laughs> practising chemist, means uh, whatever temperature the room is at, um, but you can't be bothered to record the temperature accurately because it's probably not important. Uh -huh. uh, and so you say it's 25 degrees because yes. somewhere uh, on the Earth people work in rooms 
the yes. our temperature of 25 degrees. Whereas I can tell you that working in a lab with, I think, probably single glazed windows <laughs> in Scotland in the middle of winter, that room temperature is nowhere near 25 <laughs> degrees. Um, <laughs> Excellent so, for repeatability yes. of um, your experiments. I guess what people normally say, if they want to be more accurate, is uh, standard temperature and pressure, which is 25, de- sorry, I should also say degrees Celsius, because um, there might be some yes, people so, that yeah. use Fahrenheit, which presumably is just the Americans. Um, but it's 298 Kelvin, uh, and got no idea what it is in Fahrenheit. It's probably like 70, 80? Oh, well, maybe 90. I don't know. It's somewhere between the yeah, temperature the of weird. brine that's frozen over and the average man walking into an average place having a thermometer on their body. We or won't something. ask why. <laughs> yeah, it, at room temperature, obviously. <laughs> um. Yes. Yeah, to me, the idea that uh, 25 degrees C is uh, room temperature is already amusing, never mind the fact that um, it's then not at all consistent or standard across Mm. places. But anyway, Mm. right. Well, thank you. That's answer number one, nice and concise. (laughs) Uh, My other question was... You know, so we have talked about how chemistry um, in in space mm. rather than on Earth can be very different, um, or at least we've mentioned it in passing. Yeah. Uh, do you know what kind of conditions? You, you know, what are the what are the conditions on the comet that have allowed it to right to yeah. have this material that wouldn't wouldn't exist in the mm. conditions on Earth. Well, as you know, I've never been to space, so I can't tell you personally, but uh, it's cold out there. Right? It's like a couple of... Is it even a couple of degrees above absolute zero, or is it like a fraction of a degree above zero? A degree Celsius. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, so, basically, I think... I could be wrong, but because there's also a pressure element, so it's going to be mm-hmm. low pressure and low temperature. But I think with a lot of these things, um, chemical reactions are, generally speaking, um, aided by temperature because you've got sufficient energy to overcome some kind of barrier. Makes sense. When a reaction isn't aided by that, it's generally because there's another way that does it better <laughs> that's the wrong you know there's, there's another there's another reaction it can do that has a different barrier or whatever everything is sped up by temperature i think maybe in high school we were even told something like every 10 degrees doubles the rate of the reaction or something like that so and as we know anything taught in high school chemistry is, is 100 lies it's 100 percent accurate um <laughs> Every year when they teach you a different thing, all of those are accurate. Um, So I think it's pretty much that it can't react. So it's frozen in a state that is unreactive. It's like... um, Sorry, so it's formed because it's low temperatures? Or perhaps because it's low pressures? I have no idea about the formation of it. It's probably because it's got no. But because it's cold, it's able to stay there. Is what you're saying? Yeah. So I reckon that the because it's got formed it. like that, it's probably something to do with um, radiation. Maybe. I mean, like the Earth's atmosphere has very different chemistry to what we get down here on the ground. Yeah. Um, Wildly so. Which has got lots of stuff to do with scary words like free radicals um, and such like. Um, but. I feel like it was formed and then it couldn't... Graphite in your pencil is a metastable state, which, um, if thermodynamics um, had their way, 
you just looked at what the most energetically stable thing is, it would um, spontaneously change into diamond, right? How exciting, but it, it doesn't. But, no, because you need, like, massive temperatures to overcome a barrier to change into diamond. Right. Um, which is why, you know, volcanoes happen. Uh, that's not why volcanoes happen, but <laughs> that's why volcanoes are important for diamonds, I guess, or other geological processes, because high temperature and pressure changes everything. And I think in a similar way, compared to a comet, we are high temperature and pressure. Yeah, so, yeah, very much so. Makes sense. It all, all goes on a different time scale. I guess. Mm. But yeah, so this is all getting heated, evaporated off the asteroid and glowing. I think it um it's yeah. Is it fluorescing or phosphorescing? One of them. Fluorescing? Does it have phosphorus in it? Well, fluorescent and phosphorescent is to do with whether it gets excited and then comes straight down or whether it gets up and then there's like a little oh, yeah. energy level thing. Oh. This is just giving me that uncomfortable feeling. Uh, yeah. All this chemistry that I've wiped from my brain. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember which one's which. Um, I want to say fluorescence is just up and back down. Like an electron gets excited up a level and then pops back down. You know what it's also like giving me Lasers. Lasers. Lasers, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, lasers. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah. So it gets excited by the sun and then it de excites, technical term, um, by emitting a green green light. Wow. Cool. And pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Do you reckon the last time it came around that other humans looked up and thought, wow? 50,000 years ago. Yeah. I don't know. I reckon people must have thought something, but I guess it depends on how easy it was to see. So I know that at the moment, so you're meant to be able to see it by looking up from the plough, the plough end of the plough as opposed to the handle. Mm-hmm. Um towards the North Star, the Pole Star, and it's sort of halfway in between as a green smudge. You might be able to see it with your naked eye, but I think by the time people are listening to this, you'll need binoculars. You might need even the time of recording. We've not seen it, have we? Yeah. It's well, it's actually been really cloudy here the past couple of days. Yeah. And also... So, it's... No, we haven't. It is looking a bit better out there tonight. Or it was earlier, yeah. um, before we had to do bedtime routine. Yeah. Because um, I was looking longingly up at the moon, thinking, mm. oh, I could get the telescope out. could even get the other bigger telescope out. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's not going to be happening now. I'm too tired. And... We're also getting close yeah. to a full moon, right? So there's actually um, a fair amount of light pollution, albeit... It's, um, you know, not man-made light pollution. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, depending on where you're wanting to look in the sky, especially if you're trying to look anywhere near where the moon is, it's going to be pretty bright. But yeah. if you want to look at the moon itself, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But so I don't know what the ancient humans would have seen if there was a big full moon. Maybe they wouldn't have noticed or, you know, maybe there were used to it yeah I always wonder with these things you know if you don't know what it is does it uh, is it something that you think is a good thing or is it something that feels like a bad omen you know Mm. I reckon it's probably a bit of both probably depending on how things are going you know like yeah depending on your mental state yeah yeah I think that's probably true for many things in life (laughs) But I reckon if, you know, your world in whatever way, shape or form is feeling under threat. Um, yeah, like, then a green clearly... splodge in the sky that didn't used to be there. Maybe, uh It's the end of the world. Maybe not a good sign. Or witches or something. Mm. 
Um, whereas otherwise, it's maybe the herald of a new thing. Mm-hmm. Especially if someone's born or someone just appears. That's always the story, right? Someone new in town, either via birth or just walk in. Um, <laughs> Well, yes. So if you have managed to go out and spot the comet, or maybe if you've caught a, caught a picture of it, uh, do at us on social media. Mm. Share your pictures. We can retweet or share on Instagram or whatever. We'd love to see them. Mm. And we'll see you next week. So that just about wraps things up for this episode. Please, can we encourage you to subscribe to Through the Telescope wherever you find your podcasts, and, if you like, you can leave us a nice positive review as well. It really helps the show, and it makes it easier for more people to find us. Feel free to send us any comments, questions, or suggestions of things or people you'd like to hear about or from in future episodes. Or perhaps to put yourself forward to chat about your own astro research or experiences. As always, you can find us on Instagram at Through the Telescope Podcast, or you can find me at astrophysicist underscore rose. You can also find us on Twitter at The Telescope Pod, and you can contact us by email at Through the Telescope Podcast at gmail.com. And with that, we'd like to thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye. Bye.